far ahead of his time. One more turn. It's hardly surprising that his guests found it hard to keep up. 129? <laughs> You've broken it, Babbage. Not broken, sir. Engineered. Before you came, I set the machine to jump to 129 when it reached 12. I made it happen. Though his guests couldn't possibly have understood how the device worked, what they did realize was its potential. Babbage had created a machine that could change the world. In the mid-1800s, the British Empire ran not on tea, but on tables. There were mathematical tables for everything, calculating insurance premiums, pension entitlement, and most importantly, navigation. Trouble was, there were errors, lots of them. And things could go badly wrong. Ships bound for Manila ended up in Hong Kong. The empire was running aground on the slip of a computer's pencil. Well, there are engineering applications, we all know that, but what of the rest of mankind? Hmm? Mr. Babbage's marvelous machine offered an end to human error. The difference engine would calculate and print out the vital tables, eliminating mistakes all the way through the process. And the computer will be released from his life of drudgery. Brilliant, Babbage. Quite brilliant. For once, we can actually say the British government knew a winner when they saw one. Even though Babbage only showed them this, a small part of the machine, the Exchequer responded by giving him a cheque for £17,000. And that's what it would have cost back then to buy two warships. So here we have Babbage. He's at the height of his powers. He's rich, he's connected, he's popular, and he has the funding to change the world. And he made a complete Horlix of it. First, he fell out with the one man in the country capable of making the machine, his engineer, Joseph Clement. Babbage claimed he was being ripped off. Clement walked out. Next, he changed his mind about the design and started from scratch on an even bigger, better machine, the imaginatively named Difference Engine 2. Finally, Babbage ran out of money and the project ground to a halt. The difference engine was never made. The money stopped and then the ridicule started. Even the Prime Minister, Robert Peel, had a dig, saying that if the engine were ever to be built, it should be set to calculate its own usefulness. Oh, how they laughed. Babbage's groundbreaking machine was dismissed by a weary wave of the Chancellor's hand. In the end, it was even claimed that the ridiculous crate of cogs would never have come to anything anyway. But in 1991, to mark the bicentenary of Babbage's birth, engineers at the Science Museum did build the cogwheel brain. And it did work. This is a beautiful piece of engineering. Now, what you do is you set the equation or the piece of maths that you want to do on these cogs here. Then you turn this handle and the answer comes spewing out on this piece of paper here. And that's it. Human error eliminated. All the men with pencils eaten and spat out by this brass and gun metal. The machine's accuracy was down to what Babbage called the unerring certainty of mechanism. The idea was that the position of the cog, unlike a thought, cannot be misinterpreted. Don't think, however, that the difference engine was just some kind of fancy pocket calculator. I mean, you couldn't turn that upside down and snigger at the word boobs, for example. And don't think either that it would be stumped if you tried to give it 
something more difficult than 34 to the power of 7. This thing can do ferocious calculations. Stuff like this. Now these are ballistic equations and that's important because when the Americans got their first computer in the 1940s, the first thing they did with it, the first thing was work out how far a projectile would go out of a gun and where it was going to land. They made gunnery tables. So, if Babbage had made this in 1850, the First World War would have lasted 25 minutes? No, really, think about it. Gun, trench, weight of projectile is known to you, turn the handle a few times, bye-bye Fritz. Babbage recognised the need for even more powerful machines and continued designing mechanical computers. He came up with what he called the analytical engine, which worked in almost exactly the same way as a modern electronic computer. But by this stage, Babbage had run out of people who took him seriously. And so the device, like his difference engines, remained on paper. Charles Babbage gave the world many things. Gave the theatre coloured lighting for a kickoff. And he left the railways with two different types of cowcatcher. But alas, he produced no brass brain. So the chance of a Victorian information age was extinguished. So what if the difference engine had been made in the 19th century? Well, the empire would have been even more efficient and that would have made Britain even richer. And that would have meant the First World War probably wouldn't have started in the first place. And the Titanic wouldn't have been so fatally flawed and the Hindenburg wouldn't have crashed. The list is quite simply endless. Unfortunately, however, Babbage's genius went with him to his grave. And it wasn't until the middle of the next century, 80 years later, when the men with pencils were really up against it, that the need for a mechanical computer surfaced once again. This time, it was Adolf Hitler who ensured that a computer was needed like never before. The news from France is very bad. We have become the sole champions now in arms to defend the world cause. We shall do our I'm sure we all know the story by now. It's 1940, Europe's under the Nazi jackboot, stout-hearted East End folk, Britain in big trouble. The one thing that might prevent a German victory was spying. We shall fight on. Staying one step ahead of Hitler by listening in to wireless communications between his commanders at head office and the troops in the field. Obviously, all these messages were scrambled. But it was no good looking at a piece of paper with gibberish on it and saying, well, that's impossible. If we were going to win this thing, we had to crack the codes. It was that simple. The time had come for a maths machine. A machine that could make sense of all the coded nonsense. Two men rekindled Charles Babbage's dream, and one of them was a talented marathon runner called Alan Turing. <coughs> Turing was a brilliant young mathematician, doing his bit for the war effort. Of course, he was not alone. When war broke out, the government rounded up the best academics available and put them to work on knotty problems of national importance. Turing found himself reunited with many of his friends and tutors from Cambridge, all set to work as military code breakers. Their first success was cracking the German Enigma code. That meant the U-boats were defeated and that vital Allied shipping was safe once more. The story has been told and retold. There have even been films made and plays written about Enigma. 
But Enigma was only part of what happened here at Station X, Bletchley Park in Buckinghamshire. What a place. In that very building there, they planned the D-Day invasion. In that 